Hello dear YouTube viewers, welcome to Real Turkey channel where the topic of today's podcast will be Turkey's presidential elections. This is Atilla Eşalara, your loving, caring presenter or YouTuber, major influencer in Turkey. <laughs> uh, Turkey will hold presidential and parliamentary elections on 14th of May 2023, needless to say where I already declared the winner as the candidate for the main opposition alliance and CHP party chairman, Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. Let's take a look at our cover page here. Uh, so, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu will be facing the incumbent, Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who has been either prime minister or president of Turkey for the last 20 years. Polls strongly suggest he is going to lose in the runoff uh, against Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. So we need to know this guy. Who is Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu? What is his background? What does he stand for? And what can he possibly achieve as the head of a six-party alliance which will have at best a small majority in Turkey's Congress called the Grand Assembly. Okay, um, just in case you are interested, I've already done a video on Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, already predicted that he will win uh, roughly a year ago, and explained a lot about Turkish elections. But let's move on to today. Mr. Erdogan recently declared early elections, setting the date as 14th of May, Sunday. Uh, that day, both presidential and parliamentary elections will be held. The rule in the presidential elections is to win in the first round, a candidate must get at least 50% of the votes cast, plus one vote. There is an outside chance that Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu will beat Mr. Erdogan in the first round if he can uh, get the support of the pro-Kurdish rights party HDP and a slew of small left-wing parties allied or aligned with HDP. We will find out next week. There are also other candidates, most uh, important of whom is Mr. Muharrem Ince, another center-left leader uh, who used to be a member of the CHP, but uh, none of the polls give him much of a chance. It is still reasonable to expect that Mr. Erdogan's support will be stronger uh, than anticipated by the polls. Uh, whether we like the guy or not, uh, he's sort of like Trump in the United States, has a very strong and loyal fan base. Regardless of these policies, these people will turn up to vote for him which may give him a fighting chance in the first round. But the second round is pretty clear-cut. It will come down to the Kurdish vote, and which is sort of like 12 to 15 percent of the total national vote. And Kurds are highly motivated to elect Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. How do I know? There are 13 provinces out of 81 in Turkey where Kurdish people of Kurdish ethnic background have a majority, they are polls specific to those regions uh, where poll after poll shows that 70% of Kurdish voters would, you know, elect Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu over Erdogan. Uh, before we get to who Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu is, though, let me show you a picture of him unless you have never seen him. This is from Mrs. Gonul Toll's article in the Politico titled Turkey's Gandhi sets his sights on strongman Erdogan. Yeah, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu is called Gandhi. He does look like Gandhi, uh, though whether his policies are in a way similar to Gandhi, hopefully we'll discover during the course of this video. But I don't, well, obviously these videos are political and, uh, you know, I am pro-opposition, I am a social democrat, etc, etc, but uh, I try to be <coughs> allergy season in Istanbul, by the way. I try to be as impartial, as, po as humanly possible in a situation like this. <clears throat> so let me show you some polls. This 
this is a sort of poll of polls table uh, collected by Global Source Partners Turkey team, of which I am a member. It shows uh, the leading parties, uh, the polls, and the scores of the parties. So AKP is Mr. Erdogan's party, CHP is Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu's party, E party is chaired by Meral Akşener, a very strong woman, the Iron Lady of Turkey. Then comes MHP, which is an ally of AKP and Mr. Erdogan. It's strongly nationalist and anti-Kurdish. Next is the HDP, which largely caters to Kurdish votes, but not necessarily. A lot of left-wing Turks do vote for HDP. It does stand for Kurdish equality and Kurdish rights. These smaller parties, SP, Saadet, GP, Gelecek, uh, DP, Deva Party, uh, are members of a six-party constellation called the Nation Alliance, which have united to dethrone Mr. Erdogan and to govern Turkey under a parliamentary system. So if you look at the totals here, uh, these are the results for parliamentary polls, but they give us a strong and indication of how the presidential poll will shape. Uh, as of, so, the you know, let's look at the March average. AKP scores 31.1% with MHP at roughly 7%. So AKP plus MHP are roughly at 39%, whereas at uh, 39%. Whereas CHP, E party, that's 40 plus SP, 41, GP, 43.3 plus DEWA, uh, 45%. So, right there, the National Alliance leads Mr. Erdogan's coalition called the Republican Alliance by 5 percentage points in the parliamentary polls. And also, Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu will get the support of the HDP, Pro-Kurdish Rights Party, which scores around 10%. Uh, in the March averages. These averages changed very little uh, since the beginning of the year uh, thanks to pork barreling policies AKP MHP led uh, in January and February then Turkey had this devastating earthquake uh, which dealt a blow to Erdogan's popularity because A. the damage was his fault B. Uh, rescue efforts uh, and currently the conditions under which uh, the earthquake victims live are just despicable. The state does not function under Erdogan. So essentially, assuming that anyone who votes for CHP or any member of the National Alliance in the parliamentary elections is very unlikely to vote for Mr. Erdogan, this election is already concluded. AKP MHP at 40%, which is Erdogan's base vote. Others, 60%. Ergo, goodbye to Erdogan. But we also have presidential polls. This is in Turkish, but you can just um, Google Wikipedia, Turkish presidential elections. This table shows the results of 13 presidential polls since the beginning of the year. As you see, Mr. Erdogan wins only 4 out of 13, where Kılıçdaroğlu is the victor in the remainder of them. And look at all of these polls. With the exception of one, the margins are not small. So either Erdogan will win by a wide margin or Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. Now, this table is not complete. Wikipedia does an excellent job of collecting Turkish poll results. But two of them are missing. One of them is by Turkey Raporu, Turkey Report, an impartial agency. The other one is by the March poll, 
the other one is ORC's March poll, both of which show Kılıçdaroğlu winning. So out of 16 polls, Kılıçdaroğlu wins 12. Um, just if each poll is a random trial, he has a 75% chance of winning. So parliamentary elections, it's much more difficult to forecast because there is no simple algorithm to translate parties' support ratings to the number of seats they will win in the Grand Assembly because of Turkey's completely screwed up and unfair electoral system, on which I shall do a video as time passes. But uh, it stands to reason that uh, currently uh, AKP MHP control the majority, 301 out of 600 seats, uh, now it will be the opposition, that's the National Alliance plus HDP, which will have a majority and will be able to control the legislature. So let's move on to who Kılıçdaroğlu is. As I said, <clears throat> when the polls heralded that uh, he's on his way to victory, there has been a lot of exposés on his background, on his political career, etc., I chose the one by uh, Mrs. Gonul Tol, the one I uh, mentioned earlier, Turkey's Gandhi. <coughs> it gives you a lot of information. Uh, it's published in Politico, and I shall link it duly uh, under this video. There is also an excellent reference here by Wikipedia. Where did I put Wikipedia? Oh, here we go. Also a picture of Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, who does look like Gandhi here too. He was born in 1948 in the Zaza province of Dersim, Tunceli, to a poor family. He is one of the seven siblings of the family. Uh, he's an economist. He is not a career politician, unlike Mr. Erdogan, who has been involved even in his 20s in militant Islamist politics. In fact, until 2004, uh, Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu was a civil servant. He managed Turkey's social security uh, institution for several years, and he was recruited uh, to become a member of the CHP by the then leader, Deniz Baykal. In 2010, I believe, um, yeah, 2000, yeah, 2010, Dennis Baikal had to resign because of a scandalous sex tape. I don't want to get into the details of it. This is really the very dark underbelly of Turkish politics, airing sex tapes about your rival. Um, but anyhow, he had to resign in disgrace, uh, and as a result, uh, the party elected Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu as its chairman. He has a very checkered political career. He's a nine-time loser against Erdogan in, you know, parliamentary elections and also in two uh, constitutional polls. This is why if you follow Turkey, uh, a lot of articles would suggest that he is unelectable or that he simply doesn't have the wherewithal to beat Mr. Erdogan. Above and beyond his policies, the mistakes he has committed in the past, uh, this is a very unfair representation of what's going on in Turkish politics for two reasons. A, uh, the elections are really not fair. There are huge restrictions on the ability of the opposition parties to campaign. The media is almost completely controlled by Mr. Erdogan. This is the traditional media. Social media is a free-for-all. And I think despite AKP's paid trolls, the opposition content creators like R are making a big a, 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 and more important uh, impression upon uh, the public knowledge. So I can say that the opposition is far ahead in terms of contr controlling the narrative in the social media. 
But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I think one would assume that controlling the traditional media is a huge advantage, which has become all of the, you know, pro-AKP newspapers like the Soviet Pravda. It's only propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. Uh, And finally, uh, election finances. Any business person or individual who makes a large contribution to Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu's campaign will be persecuted, not prosecuted, persecuted. He'll be witch hunted. He will be ghosted. His presence shall be erased from history. Really, this is as bad as it is. Where, you know, everyone pays homage to Mr. Erdogan. He has a crony class who get uh, billions of dollars worth of tenders from him. So they are very happy to chip in to his election campaign. And finally, most importantly, Erdogan won because despite his failings as a political leader because of his lack of respect for human law, human rights and law and order, he delivered prosperity year after year to a majority of the Turkish people. So the average Turk became richer, albeit by a small margin, each year between 2002 and say 2015. When Mr. Erdogan took over, Turkey's GDP per capita in 2002 was $3,000. It peaked around 12.5K, somewhere around 2012 to 2015. And then first it stagnated, then it declined sharply all the way to 9,000. If government projections were to be Correct, at the end of this year, GDP per capita would rise about $10,000, but that's an uh, artificially inflated exchange rate. I think the true GDP per capita is no more than $9,000. And this is why Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu will win. You know, politics is about delivering prosperity, economic growth and employment to a large extent. And Mr. Erdogan has failed miserably in that task since the pandemic. In fact, in a broader sense, uh, since the 2016 aborted coup. What does Kılıçdaroğlu stand for? Well, first of all, this guy is the exact opposite of Mr. Erdogan. Even their faiths differ. They are both Muslims, of course, though Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu is very secular. He doesn't really play his religion in his politics, but he comes from the minority Elevite or Elevi faith, whereas Mr. Erdogan is a Hanafi, is a Sunni Hanafi. Mr. Erdogan is ethnic Turk, or so he claims. Look, you know, in a country like Turkey, where human habitation goes back to 14,000 years, ethnic backgrounds are kind of sketchy. I, for instance, consider myself to be a member of the largest ethnic group, the (laughs) A-holes. Yeah, that wasn't funny, but okay. Uh, Anyhow, but ethnic background in Turkey is largely affiliation rather than DNA-based. Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu belongs to the Zaza minority, I believe, though he never talks about it, and he's an Elevite. What does he stand for? Well... He's really not into material riches. Mr. Erdogan lives in a palace with a thousand rooms. That's not a joke. Has nine or eleven private planes. He's guarded by an army of three thousand men and women and has a huge fleet of armored luxury cars. His wife is known for her predilection for shopping, reportedly His handbags are worth $50,000 a piece. She is rumored to have uh, completely closed down shopping districts in some cities so she can shop alone with her friends without being bothered by commoners like us. Whereas Kılıçdaroğlu lives in a humble middle-class apartment with his wife. Erdogan's children are rich or they run huge charities which are actually just covers for siphoning off more wealth to Erdogan and his family. 
Polish star all those children are modest. I think they're business people and in, you know professionals, but none of them have any notorious wealth. Um, Mr. Erdogan is the typical Middle Eastern male macho authoritarian leader. Kılıçdaroğlu is very mild-mannered, reconciliatory. He believes in government by committee. <coughs> he is not a scrappy fighter, unlike Erdogan. Neither does he like to polarize and demonize people. As I said, the complete antithesis. When he, I've never met Erdogan personally, but I've been watching him for 20 years, and believe me, what an ordeal that has been. When you watch Kılıçdaroğlu, it's very, I'm sorry, when you watch Erdogan, it's very difficult to be indifferent towards the guy. You either love him or you hate him. I hate him because I have, you know, problem with strong patriarchal figures. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu is dispassionate. Uh, he argues by logic. He's not a very exciting orator, uh, but he makes good points. He's more about issues than sentiment and feelings. What is he going to do if he is elected president? Nothing. Again, the exact opposite of Erdogan. Turkey's presidential system was designed so Mr. Erdogan controlled everything. Not only the executive, but the civil service. The parliament was rendered completely impotent under him. And even the judiciary was subjugated to Mr. Erdogan's personal whim. And that's what brought calamity after calamity to Turkey. <coughs> Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu proposes to delegate authority to his cabinet, to the Grand Assembly, and, you know, abide by judicial orders. In fact, the whole spirit of the nation alliance is to go back to the parliamentary system. Turkey is currently under the presidential system, which is sort of like the United States, where the White House makes policy, is the executive, and the Congress either promulgates laws or um, dithers with Mr. Biden about spending priorities and other policies. In a parliamentary system, the executive authority also lies with the legislature. The legislature elects a prime minister who is sort of the American president. Usually, the prime minister is the chairman or woman of the majority party in the parliament, but that's not always the case. UK and Germany are good examples of functioning parliamentary democracies. Now, the point is that if the nation alliance can garner enough seats in the Grand Assembly, which is 360, they will propose a new constitution to the people, uh, proposing that Turkey goes back to the parliamentary system. At which point, uh, Mr. Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu... Now, I, I don't know if they will get 360 seats. Honestly, I don't know. My feeling, based on current polls and, you know, my view of the near future, probably not. But then again, if Erdogan loses, AKP may split up and some factions may support a national referendum. So that's really a very ambiguous subject on which I hope to do more videos in the future. But assuming the Nation Alliance reaches its objective, Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu will become a symbolic president. He shall probably have some role in conducting foreign policy and arbitrating disputes which Congress cannot solve or probably intervening in very important matters just like the Israeli president does currently Mr. Herzog, I believe, uh, to stop Mr. Netanyahu's proposal uh, to destroy uh, the judicial powers in Israel. But otherwise, he'll simply, you know, preside over christening ceremonies, visit other countries as the goodwill ambassador. 
The true authority will lie with the Prime Minister, who I think will become Mrs. Merrill Actioner. Can, again, I put at the cover, can Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu reverse Turkey's sagging fortunes? Can he deliver a democracy? Can he deliver prosperity? This is not truly the question. The question is whether the National Alliance can do any of these any of these things. Yeah, I think, A, I'm 90% certain that Turkey will immediately become a more democratic country under the Kılıçdaroğlu presidency. Political prisoners will be released, and I think all restrictions on freedom of speech and assembly will be immediately lifted and One of the medieval institutions that kills freedom of speech in Turkey, the radio and television censorship board, will be abolished as soon as possible. It will be, Turkey will be less corrupt, though there is corruption in every political system, let's face it, but it will probably be more limited. Uh, Mr. Erdogan hates rules, he is very discretionary. Kılıçdaroğlu is a very rule-bound man, he is a stickler for uh, dude you know, due process, and Turkey will become a law-abiding country. In terms of the economy, before the earthquake, I would have said, yeah, immediately the nation alliance will make a huge difference. It will revert to orthodox economic policies rather than the insanity parading under economic policy uh, under Mr. Erdogan, and Turkey will uh, be able to stabilize its own away inflation and contain its unsustainable current account deficits. Also, human development will accelerate. Now, I'm less certain, not because of uh, changing my views on the National Alliance, but because of the earthquake. Repairing earthquake damage will take at least $100 billion. Now, that's an official report, or about 11% of Turkish GDP. This is a calamity of biblical proportions. I, I don't think... Any country, even the United States, cannot deal with damage of this proportion. So, at some point, I suppose Turkey will have to call in the IMF, uh, get additional financing, and hopefully uh, more foreign direct investment and quick aid uh, from the world community. But overall, I think uh, under Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, Turkey will be a much less, a much more peaceful prosperous and democratic country. Well, this has been a long podcast. I thank to my small but dedicated audience for watching these videos and commenting on them. I would appreciate if you subscribe or at least share it with those who have any interest in Turkey. So, you know, you know the YouTube, YouTube algorithm quality doesn't matter much. It's all about traffic. Hope to see you soon in another video. I can already tell you what the next video is about. Uh, if you follow Turkish presidential elections, you will hear a lot of comments about uh, Erdogan usurping power, even if he loses elections. I'm going to react to that and provide relief that Erdogan simply doesn't have the institutional support or backing to pull a feat like that. Once again, stay healthy, uh, stay prosperous, uh, and you have watched another episode of Real Turkey Channel presented by Atilla Yashilada.